um, certainly will end up some way or the other about the downstream sector. And usually the issue is about pricing, subsidy. And so just before we go in, mm -hmm. let's just situate it properly. Mm -hmm. This question, this age-old question about subsidy, no subsidy, what's been paid, what's appropriate pricing, let's put it, is there mm -hmm. a subsidy or not? <laughs> Uh, uh, for, 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 for nuance of language, let me say that we, we tended to move away from subsidy and call it under recovery. And the reason is simple. People say it's all nuances. Or it's mm -hmm. subsidy, subsidy. And maybe it is. But, but the reality is that a subsidy uh, is a term we tend to use when you are directly paying mm -hmm. straight from government coffers to a third party for pr bringing in product at basically uh, a price that is uh, lower than what should be the actual market sell price. Mm -hmm. On the recovery situation where you have, like you have now, uh, mm -hmm. the government-owned corporation, NMPC, doing all the importing, and therefore running it through their financials and their books, uh, the, the expectation is that if NMPC, for example, is doing extremely well in a different area, you might be able to suck in some of those supports. And so that's why you call it under recovery. Okay. But yes, is there? Yes, yes, there is. Somebody pays, yes, somebody, somebody picks somebody up the bills. Somebody does definitely pay. Right, and what happens, that goes straight into it and there's been so many arguments about whether it goes to the right places or not. Mm -hmm. Some say what's happening is you're subsidizing the rich mm -hmm. and not those who really need it. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, my, my position on this is uh, fairly clear. I guess my uh, private sector leaning for I came in tends to make me believe that as much as possible, ultimately when government continues to subsidize anything, they pay an opportunity cost for it. Uh, it is money you can use for development, it's money you can use for other things. Uh, but I think three or four years of being in government has also exposed me to the, the policy issues that somebody like the president will have to deal with, which is as much as that is true, what are the social upheavals that follow? How do you deal with the, 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 the very emotive environment under which uh, you need to remove that? The reality is that as a growing country, at some point, we will have to deal with that issue, um, as, as blank and as bare and as rough as it sounds. Uh, be because when you begin to spend those sort of massive amounts of money uh, supporting uh, people who own cars by their own right, which make a, who made a choice to buy cars, having to put it on the road, um, it, there's a problem. Everybody keeps mentioning uh, those who have to eat because of transportation, the poor. But a very small fraction, in my view, of those who are really impacted in this. And we can't find a formula, we need to at some point find a formula of being able to provide some level of support for those individuals, whether it's a strategic differentiation um, between normal commercial usage, uh, which the ordinary companies uh, can import and sell at the right price, and leasing NMPC uh, various stations, over 500 in the country, to now be a vehicle to provide some level of succor for transportation vehicles and the rest, so that you can reach out to the ones we're worried about. At the minimum, it will at least reduce substantially the volume of subsidies out there. So we need to deal with that because we need to provide power, we need to provide roads, we need to provide education, health, so many other things. So, um, so it is there. Now, now, at what point can you do that? That's usually the question. I think increasingly everybody is aligned, even the unions are aligned on the point that you will need to deal with a subsidy issue. Subsidy is not the best for the country. Problem is, how do you take it out? When? I tried it in 2016, and, and I jokingly, I jokingly like said to some of my friends, I lost almost 10 pounds in one week, because because the short amount of emotion and uh, the visceral attacks that you get out of it leaves away the logic of what you're trying to do, uh, and so you, you've got to look at what is your motive, sir? what's the how is the economy doing, how are people faring, how do you do this, and I'm beginning to agree, uh, which was already fundamental position of the president initially, that before you do any of this stuff, you've got to get the refineries working. You've got to have some level of control over your own production. Uh, if you don't do that and, and you throw it out in the wind, uh, commercialization might hit a, a top bottom point where the prices become uh, absolutely killing. Those are some of the arguments on the table. Yeah, but well, Minister, the, the, these are not new arguments. It's always been the same over the years, of, even with um, administrations prior to this one. It's always been fix the refineries, um, get so many things done, and so. It's like there are no new arguments here. Mm. It's a matter of um, being bold enough to do to right. do what is right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I agree. Um, the, uh, in 2016, when I had to deal with this uh, as GM of NMPC, uh, at that point in time, uh, you know, oil was so down. I think it was about 28 or 30 dollars a barrel. So uh, even getting the basic funds that we need to run the, uh, uh, the, the country was a problem. And then we we had a close to about two trillion being thrown into subsidy. And I went to the president and said, look. 
Uh, we can't continue this. Uh, it was not easy to convince him on that, obviously, because he has his, uh, obviously his, 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 his uh, emotions uh, towards the, uh, yeah. the lower end of the strata of the society. But it was ab an absolute imperative, uh, and it took a lot of conversations with the union, with uh, the assembly, with uh, executives and all that, before we did that. Um, thank what we did, because if you were to have been in 90-something Naira, relative to the landing price today, and, and let me say this, <clears throat> I've seen some papers since my last interview saying that I've said that the price of product is going to become 180. No, I said that the landing price at which the product was, is brought in is about 180. I have not said anything in terms of movements from 145 to 180. You know, but if, had we not done that, it would not have had a differentiation between, 40, one, between uh, 145 and, and nine, about, about 85. You would have had, um, sorry, about, of 145 to 180, you would have had a difference between 180 to about 85, largely about 100 Naira uh, under recovery. That would have been massive. How do you cope with this? Because we said at the beginning that these arguments are right there in the street. And um, it's a tough call when the authorities comment on the distortions in the sector. It is seen as a next move to increasing the pump price of petrol. Mm -hmm. When the authorities are quiet, there's a veiled suspicion that uh, it's only preparatory, uh, the calm before the storm, only preparatory to increasing the price of uh, petrol. And Every time there is any inkling of a discussion on the subject, petrol stations go dry. Uh, not, not well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, how do I deal with that? I deal with that by basically forecasting that possibility and trying to deal with the problems. The, the reality is, um, I, I can say very authoritatively, there is no conversation yet in government on the issue of should we take away, uh, should we increase price or not, that, yes. that, that hasn't happened. Yeah, yeah, it, that, will, it will always be a yes. yes right. because I mean, there I mean, might well be some uh, discussion. Uh, and that's that not my call to make, but we right. haven't had okay. that, you know. Um, um, as a policy advisor, I will continue to advise on what the implications of wherever we are is. Uh, the ultimate decision, no matter this, this major, uh, because that affects the entire security of the country, that lies with the president. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, is also the Minister for Petroleum. Right. So uh, we haven't had that conversation, so, so I, I need to make that very clear. Um, the, these discussions have only reawakened um, for two reasons. Uh, one, because of the, uh, the IMF or the World Bank mm -hmm. intrusion into this fair to say, look, you can't continue to show this sort of scorecards with, with this big elephant in the room packed somewhere. You need to do something about it. Uh, and that's what, that's what has quite frankly, more recently generated. And the fact that obviously as you come, as the president gets ready for his second term in office, he's got to look at the whole economic uh, um, uh, indices and say, what, what do we do about some of the elephants in the room that are sitting in there? Uh, and, and so that, that, that's, that's natural. And the conversation is welcome. But, but I, I think we've gone, like you said, we've gone through it all the time. I don't think there's any new argument on the table. The issue is, is there a new approach to dealing with this stuff when it comes? I think, I think just so that one does not also pump up that whole mm -hmm. um, uh, engagement society that creates these distortions, I, I tend to sort of downplay this. I only raised yeah. it when I was interviewed, largely because I want to say nothing is happening in that area. All Those right. who are holding for because of that is a complete waste of time. Uh, NMPC says they have enough um, um, product um, uh, uh, landed in Nigeria. They have storage for about 26, 27 days uh, at a time in, in place, so that should be okay. But that's an advisor and... Um, an expert in the field yourself, which do you think should take precedence? The economic aspect of it, the social part of it, the, the social part, the emotions, or political? I, I think we can achieve all of, all of them. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an incurable optimist. Uh, I think that if we sit down on the table and deal with the impact and the advantages we can have by virtue of addressing that issue, and then set a timetable on when this will happen and how it should happen, uh, you know. Uh, you, you can also address the individuals who are most hit by that effect. Um, so at, at some point, both, all of them are important. Uh, certainly the views of the union, the views of society are key. Uh, the government and the president's house are the, obviously at the behest and at the pleasure of Nigerian citizens. And so you must always listen to their own concerns. But at the same time, he needs to manage the economy uh, for the benefit of Nigerians. So they're, they're all important. But I think... Um, an impartial, fair, open-hearted, um, dynamic conversation on these issues. Um, it's essential uh, for us to say what next step. Luckily, we've been through this road many times. And probably the most successful was 2016, because before that, any president who tried to deal with it just never succeeded. So we were the first uh, under his leadership, leadership of President Muhammad al-Buhari to take that bullet. It um, mm. wasn't easy, but we did. 
And then we began to get over recovery, and then subsidy disappeared and all that. Uh, then, of course, the price of oil um, went up. I, I always say to people, I, I carry a twin responsibility. One is to make sure that the international price of oil goes up because Nigeria needs it. And I spend a lot of time in OPEC trying to do that. And the other, obviously, is to make sure that somehow I find a mechanism for keeping the price of uh, refined petroleum product down. I am convinced that if we can deal with the refinery issues, uh, get our production, or we can address those issues uh, a lot more dramatically. And I think the motions will be out of the table a lot more. Right. You hear people say that the biggest problem of the industry is governance. Well, you've had the privilege of superintending over the NNPC and as Minister of State Petroleum Resources. What are those steps and strategies that you've always seen you know, as the way to go? And how many of those strategies have been implemented and sustained? OK. Well, the marching orders that I had uh, from the president when uh, I was appointed in 2015 uh, it was very clear. It was going. Um, at that point, remember, we had this whole, these whole issues of fraud in the industry, of manners of uh, transactions that left the, the state very dry. And it says go in, identify those who do it, uh, clean up the organization, set it on the path of profitability, and be very brutal about it. Uh, it the others were very clear. And uh, if you remember, the first things that we did, probably within the first two weeks of my resumption, was that we remo removed the existing internal board. Um, executive directors were appointed after about uh, one month uh, a new set of individuals to take over. I focused on uh, reducing the amount of uh, spread of uh, divisions and, and because it was costing quite a lot and was re reducing focus. Hmm. I, I, I looked at it from a business model point of view and I began to task uh, chief operating officers, which is the title we now created as opposed to GEDs because most of them are not really on the board. Um, to take responsibility for delivering on profitability because there wasn't a real focus on the business model at all. We began to look at costs. I, I created something we call the 20 fixes. 20 fixes identified the 20 things uppermost in NMPC that needed to be cleaned out, that needed to be done, uh, done differently. Commercial contract terms, uh, cost of production, uh, division of profitability, uh, getting the staff aligned. We did all that. Um, we, we started all that. It was a very um, fairly um, dramatic um, six to nine months. I think I was there for about nine months. Mm -hmm. um, and, and within that time, uh, to just to show you the, the volume of work that needed to be done, I, I issued about 30 podcasts. So every Monday we had a podcast that, that told you where we were, things that were going wrong and all that. I, I think I can say that we, we've done quite a lot. Uh, for example, we began to publish NMPC's uh, uh, monthly performances so that the world would see. As bad as the numbers look, let the facts be out. It's not a close corporation. Um, you know, um, we, we, we invited the FCC, for example, to have a table with us uh, and look at some of our processes, uh, the bid processes and all that. Uh, so a lot has happened in governance. Of course, uh, nine months later, um, forward March, uh, the board, the full executive, uh, the full board was then put together, uh, which I, I took over as chairman. And then uh, the position of GMD was then handed, uh, Redden Christian, and uh, Dr. Barrow got appointed as GMD. So, um, there are lots of areas um, uh, we've, we've made uh, dramatic changes. There are areas that we can, by virtue of the nature of the law, the law, the NMPC is guided by the NMPC Act. Uh, there are things that need to change, and that's why uh, the uh, petroleum industry uh, governance bill, which uh, the assembly is working on, will be a good step. You know, ultimately, when when the issues around it are resolved. Yes, but that too, yeah, like you said, so many issues around it. The 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 president declined asset, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the Senate has gone ahead and passed it again a second time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the latest we, uh, we have on that mm -hmm. uh, bill. But so many things have been said about it. The president on one side, the legislature on the other side. Mm -hmm. And um, Nigerians are thinking, as important as this industry, this sector mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. Shouldn't there be a quick resolution of these issues? I, I hope there will be. Um, uh, I, I think the president didn't uh, refuse us. And he, he had. Um, things that bothered him, some of which were raised by us, um, that needed to be addressed for him to assent. For example, ministerial powers and the limits, the structure of uh, some of the parastatals under them, and that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, but nicely, um, um, under the president's mandate and instruction, we've also been working with the assembly collectively to resolve those issues. I, th I think most of those issues have been looked at and resolved. And, and, and I do hope that when he gets, he gets back uh, to the president, uh, obviously he will have a different mindset because of the fact that we worked on some of those problems. In 2017, you put forward a, 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 a policy, it's called, and um, 
How much of that has been put in place? And uh, what is the position today with regard to um, uh, the development seven, of the yes. The seven big wins? Yes. Yeah, well. oh, oh, yes. Um, big wins and big wins indeed. Uh, and quite a lot of, on, on each of those seven, we've, we've scored some major, major highlights. You take, take, take the international aspect of it, for example. Within that period, we've had the, uh, the privilege of being OPEC president, getting the secretary general in place in OPEC, uh, who's a Nigerian, who had the uh, ability to help lead uh, the, uh, the, the trial, uh, the quadruple of uh, Nigeria, Russia, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Venezuela at some point uh, to help influence the policies of um, of, of the, the pricing. Uh, at the time that we joined, pricing was nip, nip, uh, nipping really more like it was thirty dollars. Um, now, as, as as of yesterday, I think it was about seventy one dollars for most of our uh, uh, graded crude. So, whatever policies we we worked on at the international level has succeeded. Nigeria got exemption three times from those courts. Uh, we've just been hit by one uh, court uh, obligation now since December, which we're complying with since February. So, so from that perspective, uh, achieving numbers and volumes and money, we did. Uh, we put in place um, um, the issue of the governance, um, business models, cost of production, tracking crude. Uh, well, DPR has been able to put together for the first time in this history um, um, uh, an IT template that enables them to track production online real time as it happens and be able to give you numbers almost on the hourly basis. So, uh, issue of uh, crude disappearing, where's Nigeria oil, is it now the past? Of course, you still have some interventions by individuals who go into brake pipes, uh, which are exceptions, but, but they're, they're, they've been reduced to the barest minimum. Uh, you take the issue of uh, governance, uh, I already told you what, I've, what we've done in terms of uh, governance in NNPC. We'll continue to monitor those, but governance not just in NNPC. There are seven parasitals. All of them are going through major transitions. They probably are not as emotive as NNPC, but DPR is going major transitions. NCDMP is doing the same thing. Uh, PPPR, uh, PEF, all of them. We've been able to get those to, to align with the fact that the business has got to run holistically with a mind at getting it profitable. Now, now what are we challenged with? Um, um, two weeks ago, uh, Saudi Aramco, which is which is a NMPC, um, which is Saudi Arabian equivalent of NMPC, um, announced its profit, two hundred billion dollars, becoming the most profitable company in the world. Now, of course, they're dealing with reserves, uh, mm -hmm. four, five, maybe ten times ours, so, so one can understand that. But even by its sheer um, um, logical projection uh, on numbers, uh, if, if, if they're 10 times high, am I making the equivalent of 10 times that, that profit? So we need to begin to focus on that. But one of the things that they say to you is that the fact of being um, a public sector company is not an excuse for not being efficient and profitable. Now that you talk about um, uh, international forays, I, for most people, except those who are directly involved in the industry, the fact that Nigeria heads um, organs like OPEC. Now you've been president of OPEC, mm -hmm. uh, president of uh, the Gas Exporting uh, Country. Countries Forum, GCF, yes. and uh, you've Lapo. also just been re-elected for a third time. We understand it's unprecedented mm -hmm. as uh, president of APO, yes. which is Association of African Petroleum yes. uh, Producers uh, Organization. Uh, organization. Mm -hmm. People wonder, what's the impact of these leadership positions? How does it impact on Nigeria's position and what's expected of it? Okay. First, in terms of immediate impact, immediate impact is respect for the country. Uh, we were at a very low ebb where nobody was even taking us serious. Uh, suddenly we begin to head, head uh, organizations such as, as serious as this, it, it helped. So all due to the, uh, obviously, the, the, um, the goodwill that the president brings to this position. Um, second is that it enables us to create uh, areas of of influence on those on those organizations. For example, we had to substantially, as president, lead the movement, which was trajecting against internal competition. You produce as much volumes, we have more volumes than you. Type, you know, internal cannibalization. We moved from there to a collectivism that enabled us bring prizes back out, which is what we're still doing today. And even after I've handed over as president, that's that's been the trajectory. Uh, we created a, a monitoring group, which Nigeria is a member, making sure countries are keeping to it. Uh, on the upper level, I took the position that unless internally we can grow the African market, 400 million potential consumers, uh, we, we're seeing a movement in world uh, oil market that, that is very troubling. America has hesitated. So 20, 20 to 30% of our exports used to go to America. That's gone. They are now a net exporter. Um, a lot of countries have come in as potential uh, find areas and reserve areas. Um, the Asia that we depend on is moving fairly rapidly towards uh, a level of science 
um, that, that will take them away from these traditional volumes of consumption, electricity, uh, solar, um, um, uh, nuclear. And so that market is not there forever. So Africa is the market that we need to handhold. Two large producers in Africa, Angola and Nigeria, Nigeria being the highest, what are we doing with that market? Fairly nothing. So developing that and uh, being able to do trans-border infrastructural investments, cooperative um, um, uh, explorations and all that stuff is key to developing Africa. Plus it gives us a voice that is strong uh, collectively in international organizations. Since I, I took over as Apple president and since uh, I left as the president of um, um, uh, OPEC, uh, we have seen about five other African countries come in within OPEC and through my influence be admitted into OPEC. So, so it does give us quite a lot in terms of voice. And, um, and the international politics of oil uh, in terms of pricing, and you do find that pressure is put on OPEC countries so many times, particularly by the U.S. To, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and and, and uh, people quarrel with Trump first. I, I mean, America first under Trump. I said, no, no, no problem with that. Let's do Nigeria first. Let's do Africa first. Everybody look after your first internal interest and then we can look at the global interest. Um, the, the, the reality is, is that uh, President Trump will continue to do what President Trump does best, put everybody under pressure for the sake of uh, um, American interest, which is fine. Uh, uh, Nigeria also needs to begin to do the same. OPEC needs to begin to do the same. OPEC, incidentally, uh, does only about 33 0.5% of world uh, oil production and sales. So when everybody relies on OPEC and what we're doing, it, uh, you find the amount of uh, un unbelievable burden on, the, on an organization that produces only a portion of it. And so that's why we reached out to the non-OPEC countries in the OPEC Plus agreement uh, to say, no, we can't continue to bear this burden, you've got to come in. So Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, quite a few countries joined, and that has given us a global voice that is much stronger. But even with that, that's still probably about 50% of world producers. Um, because others are not in those organizations. Mm -hmm. So at some point, the world has got to have a conversation of what they want. Do you want a stable price? Do we have one? Because when you have an unstable price, it's not just the producers who suffer. Most of the production is done by fairly large-sized corporations uh, from countries that are not necessarily OPEC members. So global numbers suffer, global economics suffer. We need to find a way of being able to produce enough to keep the world uh, engined but at the same time, <clears throat> not overproduce to hurt the essence of research and, con and, co and continue it in, in, the, in that sector. When the prices go up, shouldn't it be a good thing in terms of earning more money? But is it, does it relate that same way with Nigeria? Because there are arguments to say well, the price is up and uh, we earn more money, but we expend more money because of um, uh, the state in which uh, the industry is locally. We do earn money. We do earn a lot more money when the prices go up, no doubt about that. The numbers when we were $30 is certainly not the numbers when we were $70. Uh, do we spend more because of aged infrastructure? Yes. Uh, because of our unique circumstances in terms of militancy? Yes. Thank God we were able to sort of put a cap on that. Uh, do we spend more money because of a bit of inefficiency in the running of the sector? Yes. Uh, do we spend more money because the existing con some of the old contractual terms, a lot of which we, we are um, gradually phasing out and cleaning out and waiting for contractual deeds to expire so you do not breach a contract to change. Um, uh, um, we are um, not as much as, probably not as nimble as I would love to see those sort of numbers so we can get the maximum returns. Uh, but certainly higher prices are much better than lower prices any day for this country and for any other country in the world. Uh, but again, higher prices get to a point where they become a disincentive to those who are buying or those who are, who, who are consuming. Uh, so uh, balancing, and mm -hmm. I think those numbers we've, we've averaged said in OPEC between a 65 and $75 type uh, monetary time frame or pricing time frame suits everybody. Um, uh, the consumers will tell you they'd rather be closer to 50 than that. But So that's where the, uh, the, the competition is. Would it be better for Nigeria, for instance, the infrastructure is um, overruled and uh, things are functioning in the, you know, a better state? Than, would it be better for us? And if so, well, it's, it's, it's something that's um, taking such a long time. Uh, Cyril, it's money. Uh, it's money. Um, I, am, uh, I am absolutely gung-ho on the fact that we need to look at our infrastructure. Every year we do roads, we do trains, we do airports. Well, fantastic, but quite frankly, the goods needs also to be looked after. You know, uh, and that's the oil industry. We have not really invested in infrastructure in the oil industry since uh, the last 40, 50 years. 
Uh, a lot of that because everything really is substantially packed back to the Federation, and you're therefore going to have to go back and, and ask for some of it. But more important because the business model has been too public sector pro. Mm. Uh, we, we need to lift our hands a little bit out of that sector and let it run like a business, uh, which means which means which means that um, if you take safe oil importation, which is a massive obligation now on the oil, national oil company, we've got to find a way in which the private oil companies participate and take some of the burden. If you look at infrastructure pipelines and the rest, we well, we started that. The AKK, the OBOB, are all based on private sector model. Um, it's been funded by the third party private sector. We've been able to reduce. We've been able to re-engineer the cash a cash call system such that oil companies can actually go to the banks and take money and rely less on government and, and pull that out of the cost of their production. So there's some dramatic things we've done, which is brought back exploration. Uh, when we started in 2015, there were no rigs in Nigeria. Everybody had gone. Um, uh, no real new capital development was being done. Uh, since then. The investments um, uh, potentials uh, have risen. Exploration is back full steam. Production is up uh, from the 800,000 barrels to about 2.2 billion barrels today. We have near FID positions in about three to four projects, whether it's uh, uh, Bonga, whether it is um, um, uh, uh, Mobile Sawa, whether it's uh, Zaba Zaba, which has its own unique problems and all that. Uh, what is a Gina that has just uh, be began with about 150,000 barrels additional production. So things are beginning to move in the right trajectory. But infrastructure, and, and I've said that over 20 to $30 billion is required to massively deal with infrastructure in this sector. That's not money government will ever have. That's money the private sector can bring. We just need to continue to work on the policies to enable us to do that. But it's in an era of PI, potential PIGB. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody sort of just waits. Uh, to see that happen before they go in. The refineries, for instance, apart from talks about modular refineries, uh, it would seem that it's just one major step has been taken by one private sector individual uh, to set up. And there are those who also argue that um, couldn't the government have uh, invested more in refineries? It's, it's, it's a chicken and egg type thing, to be honest. Uh, first of all, the singular uh, investment in one single refinery, which is Dangote Refinery. Let, let's step back. Policies make this happen. Uh, and the amount of work that we've done from Minister of Petroleum, working with him to get to where he is, uh, was a totally different change. And he will be the first to tell you this is a different type of uh, government uh, private sector relationship. Usually, I think it tends to be competition. Why are they going to do this? Uh, how, why should they we'll be able to help? Now I've visited there three times. My people have visited there over ten times. We're encouraging him because because we need to do that. And a lot more people should build. Mm -hmm. We should be the right model. The modelers we've worked very hard in putting the policies and beginning the process and creating some financing. Three near um, uh, completion and that's seven uh, finishing up, uh, getting up to FID stages. Local refineries, uh, which are NMPC owned, quite frankly, one NMPC has got to deal with that asset. It's their asset. Uh, I can only introduce directives and policies. We did get authorization from the president to, to get into the private sector and get private sector people to invest, not to own. Hmm. That in itself was a tall order uh, because anybody who invests money wants to own. Uh, people don't have a business giving loan to government when they're not even sure of the efficiencies. And Nigerians see yes. these refineries yes. as um, public a assets. Absolutely. Um, so, but, but again, if you decide you're going to sell it, the um, president's position was if it is in this comatose state and you sell it, you're selling scrap. You're not going to get any revalue for all the investments. So let's try and work it. I've left that with NMPC. They've, they've mm -hmm. negotiated over the last one and a half years. Unfortunately, they haven't been able to land at commercial terms that are acceptable to them. Uh, there have been talks of they going in to begin the usual term in say Port Harcourt and the rest. I'm not very supportive of that. I'm, 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 I think that ultimately we need to do for private sector involvement, uh, find the right commercial terms. And it's one of the things I hope I'll be able to uh, continue to work with them and NMPC and bring it. I had hoped, I had hoped in 2017, uh, when these approvals were given, or 2016 late, that quite frankly, we, by end of 2019, we would have finished and been exiting Okay, so, uh, the so the turnaround products. maintenance may not be it for you. For, for me, not. Uh, but, but you know, the, the beautiful, the beautiful thing about this uh, sector is that I'm not the sole, I'm not the sole determinant of these okay. policies. Uh, mm -hmm. That's my view. And NPC has his view. I'm sure the president also has his own thinking. Uh, so we're going to have to land it, land it. And why do I say it can be? We've done many turnaround maintenances. A lot of the difficulties we have today is that the, the turnaround maintenance we're done were never ever complete never ever delivered the right solution and was never ever kept up.
Second is that it costs a lot of money. Um, projected cost of uh, rebuilding those, uh, re kitting those three, three to four refineries, anywhere between 2.5 and $3 billion. We don't have it. In, you know, so um, uh, can we find it? Yes, we can find it. Uh, can we set the right commercial terms? Yes, we can. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think we just need to take the bullet and move on. Right, the other aspect of it which, um, yes, except for recent times, has not been really looked at, gas. Mm -hmm. So you talk about gas commercialization policy. Mm -hmm. Let's hear about that. Now. Well, well, the first thing is uh, we did a gas policy that was approved by Federal Executive Council. The whole idea was to begin to create a real focus on gas. What people say, you keep talking about gas. Why is gas not taking off? Reason is simple. It requires infrastructure. The pipelines have to be built to take the gas. Uh, the right incentives uh, need to be put um, um, to remove this apparent laziness that are coming to the industry. And what's that laziness? If an oil company is in production and finds oil and finds gas, you know what it does? It closes the taps on gas because oil is selling. It leaves the gas. Um, it flares the gas where it can, right? uh, injects it back into the ground to create pressure, and lets the rest be. It focuses on the oil. In some cases, we find only gas, it, it covers it unless there's a direct uh, commercialization arrangement for that gas. Why is that? Uh, are, they, are they being on, on Nigeria? No. The real, unless you have real right commercial terms for developing anything, it, it won't happen. Uh, oil has been developed because they're, they're pure commercial terms for oil. And then what intended to happen is that whenever they needed to do gas, they had to go back to the oil discovery to say, okay, we're going to develop this gas subject to being able to charge the cost to the oil. And we're saying, no, you've got to separate both. So the policy, the gas policy enabled you to create twin income streams I look at how to uh, cover both the upstream, midstream, and downstream of gas, separate it from oil. And, uh, and some of that requires a change in law, or which the assembly is working on. Some of that requires regulations. The ones that require regulations are the ones that we're targeting, because we can't change the law ourselves. So uh, first thing is flare. How can we get out of flare? Um, and, and I came up with the gas flare commercialization. Gas flare commercialization is a concept whereby you say to the oil companies, why can't you stop flare? And they say to you, because we do not have both the commercial terms nor the counterpart funding from NMPC to be able to invest in things that would take the flare out. And it's okay, fine. If that's the issue, let's find third parties who have 100% of the money to come in and your fields and take the flare and, and convert them as long as they're within the safety parameters that you will approve. That's the essence of the gas flare commercialization. Fantastic responses, over 4,000 applications. Uh, I think at last count they had a downsized about 800 potential um, uh, opportunity points uh, and about 350 flare uh, side points all over the country. And then suddenly the oil companies come back and say, okay, you know what? Rather than have these third parties into our field, we also have a process of being able to do this and we're now ready to do it. So, for me, it is not a nuance of contract, it's a nuance of the ultimate achievement. So what has happened now is that everybody's racing towards a 20, 20 deadline that I said that we need to get out of the flare. People say to me, how is that possible? This is 2019. Well, we're 70% gone in terms of uh, gas flare. The deadline is 20? 20. 20. You know, the, um, hopefully end of 2020. That's what we've put. Now, but that is not cast an eye on let me correct right. that. But some countries are looking at zero flaring by 2023 and... Um, no, 2030, actually. 2030. Yes. And... Uh, this is even causing some form of uh, uh, civil disturbances in some countries of the world. Yeah, but, but everybody, um, ev the, the populace wants to exit flare. The, the environmental hazards are too much. It's no longer an issue of commerce, an issue of health. Did we start too late in Nigeria? At some point it was thought that um, there were money issues involved here. You paid and then you flat the gas and uh, the, the goalposts kept changing. Yes. Uh, pressure was put on uh, politicians mm -hmm. and uh, the deadline kept changing. I, I, I think it's just a, a, a mental reframing of, of what the problem was and how to find a solution. We tended to focus on, well, if you can get out, uh, let's face it, all the JVs have government as participants. So if you see you're going to spend $100 mm -hmm. on a flare site exit program, government has to give you 60 Government never had money to ever bring in the 60. And so the oil company said, well, my fault is not going to do it. Let me flare. And then government said, well, if you have to flare, you pay a cost. It's an income stream for us. We've moved the goalposts from being an income potential to being a health no-do situation. Right. And that is why you're seeing us ramping up all these programs. So did we start late? Maybe we did. Um, could they have done differently? I, I really can't answer depending on what was pushing it at the time. But we are certainly under the direction of the president doing this very differently. We're exiting. 
uh, we're watching the environment, we're compelling everybody to open it up for points of commerce and opportunity, all right. and, and that's moving well. In the midst of all these, you have the um, dire streets which the country is in with regard to energy, and of course domestic use of gas. How has that progressed? It's um, uh, my, my colleague Fashala has done pretty well um, uh, in terms of um, taking on the problems and trying to tackle them. Uh, he's moved um, current production from about 5,000, uh, 4,800 really, down to close to about 7,000 now. Um, the only reason, however, is that there's a difference between what you generate and what you actually distribute. Uh, and distribution is dependent again back to infrastructure, with argument on infrastructure. Uh, and of course, you know that sector was privatized at some point. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the discos and the genkos are all uh, key participants in this. We currently have uh, over 2,000 uh, megawatts of electricity, which we call trapped and utilized. Uh, trapped because they've been produced, but, but we don't have the facilities to distribute them. And so they're working uh, internally on all kinds of modules to reach out to those trapped uh, trap, trap potential. But key thing is that that number is moving. Uh, we've increased gas gas availability to that. Um, I'm reading right out to oil companies. As, uh, the, the, the zeal to export is fantastic, but the zeal to internalize is even more important for me. So we need to provide gas to anybody who needs gas to help us with industries, to help us with electricity, uh, before we begin to focus on uh, money that we can earn. And, and to enable that happen, we're looking at all kinds of models, pricing policy on, on parity, so that you're not losing much by virtue of putting it in locally. Right. So, that, so that is ongoing, and that is very helpful. Okay, that uh, pricing would certainly come in again, and um, let's hope we will not face the same situation. <laughs> to do. With, with the fuel. <laughs> yes, that, talk about uh, cooking gas, for yeah. instance, yes. and people wonder why we have so much, and um, yet, but again, you say the infrastructure isn't there now. Yes. Who would well, drive well, for that? cooking gas, we, 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 you know, a few days ago with the Nigerian Army, we launched our, uh, yes, our, the LPG. our, our LPG deployment, local deployment what program. What is that about? That is about getting LPG into the homes of everybody. Uh, we're hoping that we've, we've created a model that enables people to set up local filling plants in, this, in the, all the local government uh, areas. We're trying to see how we can get uh, the, the bottles, the LPG bottles. Um, uh, to, to not influence the price. Because one of the th key negative determinants here for the uh, individuals in the rural areas is you have to pay 20000 to buy the, the, yes, the can, the, the cylinder. The, 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 and then you then pay for the guys, ah, no, no, that's not, I can burn my firewood. So we're trying to create a model now that takes the price of the cans and puts it in the hands of distributors who therefore own the cylinders and simply sell you the gas. Um, and that's going to be replicated all over the country. So Nigerian Army has become the, uh, call it the guinea pig signpost uh, for us to do this. And they just, they just flagged off there. The Navy and the rest are trying to, and they begin to look at commercial nerve centers and begin to look at how you set up this sort of distribution okay. chain. Well, uh, Minister, fantastic as that might sound. Uh, the fact is people are still logging around bottles. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe I'm leaping too fast. Certainly, that isn't the ideal, is it? Bottles, you mean in terms of moving yeah, around? Yeah, moving around, you know. Well, you, well in, in an ideal world, uh, you, you if, you're, okay. yeah, if you're abroad, you pipe. Right. So you go so. straight into your home. We haven't piped. We haven't gone to that point. That is not a petroleum industry. It's going to be a works and housing yes. uh, type, type um, uh, standards to set. But Nigerians are also very frightened about <laughs> what can happen if anything goes wrong. <laughs> uh, and boom. You see a building go up in flames because it's, you know. So I want to deal with the ones that are easier. Uh, how do I, even if I'm, I'm 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 busy distributing these these cylinders, if I give put the distribution in the hands of one mono individual in an area who is an expert in it and who has his vehicles, and can come to fill up in your own area or fill up in his own uh, uh, center for, or the plant and then bring it back to you, which is what most of Europe does. You know, basically um, a, a refilling and a, a delivery type service. And charge a minimal fee for that because they own the cylinders, so they protect, so they chase their cylinders and they chase their market. If we can get it to that point, then we can begin to now work with uh, the Ministry of uh, 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 Works, uh, Works uh, and Housing to say what do you do to uh, push the regulations on multi uh, zonal developments. For example, uh, just like we've been able to look at power getting into some of these very ring fenced uh, private sector develop development housing. How can we also move along with gas as we're doing that? Uh, set up a mini gas plant in, in, that, in that facility, mm -hmm. distribute gas. So, so it's an end-to-end -end type situation within a, a limited ring first environment. Those are easier to achieve. And over, over a period of time, 
how you now decide that every house in Lagos, for example, will have a gas pipe going in there. That's going to be a huge, huge... <laughs> so let me deal with the ones that, quite frankly, are real, realizable. And <laughs> All right. Well, the penetration project yes. started with the army. Yes. Um, Next is um, <laughs> what are the well, the, whole of, the whole of the armed forces are, are tying into the navy's doing something, mm -hmm. uh, the joint air force is doing something. With the the residential home associations mm -hmm. are doing something, the developers, um, um, local uh, government type distribution points. Okay. Um, then the filling stations are going to be tied in to have, uh, as a minimum condition, DPR is going to come up with the regulation requiring that part of the requirements of the filling station is you're going to have a decanting point there so that everybody can go to a filling station like you go for your gas and fill up your cylinder and they will have a mini plant within the station. So those are some of the things we're going to use to drive, uh, drive all this. Well, again it's been said um, the local content policy has not really delivered, has it? Oh yes, absolutely. Has it? Absolutely. In real terms? Many, many times over. Um, we, we started the local content policy at the point okay. where we were about 5% compliant on local content. Today we're about 38%. Uh, the target is over the next 10 years to so get about 70%. So where then are we yeah. getting arguments about um, lack of competencies in the industry? I, I don't think that's been the argument. Um, uh, one of the things, uh, uh, thank God, we've been able to develop in this sector over the last 30 years is absolute competence. In fact, we're exporting competencies all over Africa right now. The problem had been opportunity mixes. Uh, are the established oil companies given enough opportunities to Nigerians? Mm -hmm. So we move from just hiring Nigerians right. to looking at the business model. What, what business jobs are you giving to them? And that's where you're seeing this leaping movement uh, to about 30-something percent. We'd like to get that over 70 percent in, in the nearer term. Uh, because what that does is that just different from the, uh, what you get by selling your crude, you're actually getting real-time business commercial benefits, which tends to impact on. I'll give you an example. If all the pipes uh, that you use in the industry are made here, uh, coated here, installed here, now that is the component of earnings that goes uh, into, into, into your local um, uh, 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 business model, different from selling the ultimate product, which is the crude or which is the gas, as the case may be. If you're bringing all the vessels, and the vessels, for example, are either brought in, right now they are brought in and put in by Nigerians, but you like to see a situation where you have maybe a vessel building uh, company here that can actually take on some of those. Uh, Niger Dock, I think, has started some, but you, you need to expand that sort of facility. So what we're doing is looking at each business model and telling the oil companies, uh, and, and NCDMB has a rule of uh, never going backwards, uh, moving forward. So, for example, when Agena, uh, the Agena whole uh, deployment was the first time in our history where some of the capsules were actually developed here in Nigeria by Nigerian companies and then exported uh, to Korea to be fixed into the engineer platform, which was being then built in Korea. Uh, I think we achieved about a 30% factor in, in Nigeria. We'd like to see, now that Shell wants to do Bonga, we'd like to see Shell do about 50%. If Nigeria LNG wants to do Train 7, we'd like to see an exit of 50%. So you keep using the projects to drive the potentials and possibilities. One thing I can say to you very, 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 very proudly, so this is one country where uh, if you create the opportunities, uh, Nigerians go for it. Nigerians are aggressive about their business, they're aggressive about the opportunities. I uh, just name it. Um, we've seen the Project 100 that we, we launched. Uh, we've seen the sort of uh, massive application interest in it. Uh, we've seen the gas flight commercialization. We've seen the massive interest in it. Um, every time you bring out an opportunity, there are legions of Nigerians waiting to take advantage. So um, there's no want of appetite uh, in this sector. Let's talk about um, human capital development, particularly uh, from the angle of the ministers, the technocrats who drive the policy. Mm -hmm. What did you meet on ground and what have you been able to do within the period you've been Minister of State, Petroleum Resources? I, I think I met um, a fairly reasonably developed um, working populace. Um, probably misapplied if it's in the public sector in terms of who is giving what. And I like to see efficiencies rule a lot more than politics, that's one. Um, and we'll try to realign them. Because the truth is that there's no part of the country, there's no part of Nigeria where you do not have very skilled and very efficient and very capable people. So really, it should therefore, there's really no, therefore no reason, you know, to, you know, to, um, to bottle down on, on, on skills and capabilities and deliver an efficiency. However, continuous training was, was a gap. Uh, the ministry that, quite frankly, regulated the industry was almost bereft of, of qualified people because you had a central pool of postings into the ministry from the office of the head of service. So people get posted to the ministry without uh, proper reference to whether or not they are qualified 
Uh, so if you get a director of um, upstream, for example, and you find he has a PhD in history, uh, you know, and he's not done upstream work, uh, it's, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> so one of the things we're beginning to do with the head of service is to sit down and say that postings to this ministry would dramatically change. And if you look at the PIGB, you see the Petroleum Inspectorate um, um, group, which has been formed to aid the office of the minister. Because you come to a typical minister's office, unless he has the brain cells to develop all these policies and drive them, he's left alone in, in, a, in a tea, in a teacup of uh, very many people who do not have the skill sets to do it. Uh, except you go to the, uh, I'm not, the parastatals have the key sets, but they're not in the ministry, and the ministry is a policy driver. Uh, and so what I then did was to get out into the industry and into these parastatals and pull out people who I appointed as uh, senior technical advisors, uh, about six or seven of them who work with me. They are the engine room for all the things that you see us doing. But the right thing is they should have a permanent structure. And, and the industry started that way. DPR, for example, was the engine structure for the ministry. That's why it's called Department of Petroleum Resources. When they therefore become, became the regulator and then moved out and became a bit more independent, it meant that you left, you took the, you took the brain cells out right. to, form, um, to do a regulatory and, and enforcement job. And then you left the enforcer alone with, with no brain cells. Right. So, so what you therefore had to do was temporarily fill that. But ultimately, you need to create an institution that makes that a permanent feature because you even have to supervise DPR, DPR yourself. It's been a bit easier because of one's, uh, obviously one's uh, experience in the sector. Uh, but if you appoint somebody on a political platform uh, as minister who didn't have experiences in this, uh, it, would be, it would be mayhem. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to address those uh, because industry is too important. Okay, the part of politics will come to us will begin to wind up. <laughs> but, you know, everyone talks about oil mm -hmm. in Nigeria. It's, uh, sometimes we wonder whether it's a football or oil that's more talked about in Nigeria. But mm -hmm. the part of it that you do here, and sometimes the uninitiated may bandy around stories. There are mm -hmm. controversies about oil blocks, mm -hmm. oil blocks licenses, renewals, who gets what, should Nigerians own oil blocks, who are those who should own, are these rewards for certain, you know, uh, let, let me Masters. say this. Um, the easier one is to ask whether Nigerians should own oil blocks. If Nigerians don't own oil blocks, who is going to own them? <laughs> so that's not even an argument at all. If Nigerians have the capability and meet the terms to own an oil block and it's approved by the president, they should own it. I don't have a problem with it. Um, and and, and uh, this is the ones that own it who must manage it in a way that yields the maximum income for the for the country. Can it then turn into yes. a political tool or weapon? Potentially, yes. Um, but, but this president, for example, hasn't uh, given out any oil block. In, in our four years, we've not done any oil block. Uh, marginal fields, uh, policies were developed, we didn't do it. Um, green, greenfield blocks were developed, we didn't do it. Uh, and his argument was clean up this whole mess around before we begin to throw more uncertainty into the air. Hopefully in the second term, uh, he, he will do that. But we're going to have to uh, advise on parameters, uh, even for presidential discretions. And that's what I was told. What are the minimum conditions um, you know, to be able to achieve those so that, so that you're, you're not affecting the, the essence of pro proper performance and income legitimacy? So, so that's one thing, at least. So that's something that we can pack on the side because it hasn't been a problem for us. In terms of renewals, we began an early renewal policy, which is an initiative of my ministry. And the whole idea was don't wait until it is time. One, because we needed the money, uh, quite frankly. Uh, and two, because it created certainty in the industry. If you're going to do an investment of 15 billion and you have only four years to go in your license, you won't do anything until you get a 20 year period. You wouldn't. And so we began that. Very successful, raised over $2 billion as a result of this. Um, very methodical, very transparent. True DPR comes to me, goes on to the president. Um, where in that is renewing blocks of those who already have blocks and are in right. production and whose licenses are due for renewal. How do you respond to allegations that the government might be using this um, as payback or as arm-twisting tactics for opponents of its policies? You mean the renewal or the, yeah, the new renewal, block issuance? When new block issuance hasn't no, got no, to no. both the, the, yeah. the, the renewal. <laughs> the renewals, yes. No, not at all. The, the right. renewal starts from an application by you that you have a block which is aspiring in X mm. year and you want to get extra years. So first it starts without any political cap. It's not right. an APC or so, PDP cap. Right. It's, when it's it a goes in and then? When it, goes on, when it goes in, which usually will come to my office, mm -hmm. I will refer all of them to DPR, which is the regulator, who does an analysis that says to me, have they met the terms of the lease? Terms of leases, are you producing? Right. Right. Uh, are you paying your royalties? Are you paying your taxes? 
are you meeting NCDMB uh, mm -hmm. requirements in the industry? Uh, the, the wells that you promised to drill, have you drilled them? The production you promised to meet, have you met it? You know, they're very clean right. scientific parameters. Okay. They send that to me. My technical team looks at what they sent to me and satisfies itself that they are right or they are wrong or there are questions to be raised. We send a requirement on this and our own position back to the presidency because uh, bear in mind, uh, my president is also my minister. So he looks at it uh, with his own technical team there and says, well, I agree with the minister. Oh, I don't agree with the minister. He doesn't always agree with me in all of it. Um, he may just say, no, these fees you're trying to charge. I said that we're trying to charge really, really large fees. We needed the money. Sometimes he will come back and say, this is a bit too high. Sometimes he come back and say, this is not high enough. So he deals with that as opposed to the technical issues, because technical issues really is a DPR determinant. And then that comes back to me with instructions of, uh, could you address ABC? I'm just giving you the, the making it A to right. Z. And then I send it back to DPR. Well, ABC has been raised. Could you please address right. it to our satisfaction? They address it. I'm satisfied. I send it back to him. He said, okay, now I'm fine. Please go ahead and renew under the terms that you have enunciated. We do. You pay. It's... There's, there isn't any APC, PDP, <laughs> NNP, whatever consideration it is. It's simply you hold a block, you have the technical okay. efficiency, you've made the terms, boom. <laughs> okay, all <laughs> right, Minister, it. as we round up, there's still on the political side, this, this last bit you might not really want to talk about, but, uh, <laughs> okay. well, you do serve this government, and uh, the Buhari administration, President Buhari, has just been given uh, another mandate. Let's talk in the political, you know, circle, that perhaps not all members of the cabinet are in sync with the president's goals, and in fact, beyond that, that a uh, number of uh, the cabinet members couldn't politically deliver. I'll take the first, which is being in sync, mm. um, uh, and I've not heard that line of the argument. I mean, if you're not in sync, the right thing to do is to resign. I mean, oh, right. You shouldn't, so you shouldn't be in a, it, shouldn't be in a government if you don't even support it. So you. I right. doubt that there's any minister uh, who was not in sync with the president. Because in fairness to him, it's not like he just rules out every morning in all kinds of policies. The policies are developed by his ministers, brought to fair executive council, reviewed by sometimes the economic management and led by the vice president, brought back to the fair executive council, debated, approved. Then, then it goes. It goes to um, the various ministries to go and execute. So, uh, I wouldn't know why anybody would sit there and not be in sync with him and say, "Hang on to his straw hat. How is it going to work?" So that that I'll push on the side. Now, the the issue of ministers delivering. I've heard that one saying that uh, some of us have political liabilities to him because we can't generate as much votes <laughs> as it were. <laughs> Probably there's, there's some positivism in that. I, I'm going to be the first to say, uh, let, let, let me not talk for my co-ministers. Everybody has to determine whether he was a liability or was an asset. I want to believe I was an asset, uh, despite not having any real experience in politics. Right. I haven't done this before. I came straight from the industry as a technocrat <laughs> and landed here. But, but, but for Delta, where there was a lot of contention, uh, a lot of fast recital in, 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 in internal strifes uh, in, in the system, my duty for three years was to try and find peace, get out court cases, bring unity. Second duty was to make sure that when the election came, we all went into it as, as a global one front. Right. Third issue is that because the president won only about 5% in 2015, we needed to move up that performance in there. Okay. So we, I don't think anybody ever expected that Delta would come out winning um, um, for APC. But if, if Delta didn't win for APC, APC must perform so well that it, AP, Delta didn't become a handicap to okay. states like Kano. Uh, that brought in massive amounts of votes. We, we did 35%. In my right. own local government, uh, we did about 38%. Uh, okay. In fact, I won my ward and my units in, in the House of Rep um, um, okay. um, um, contest, as it were. And in the governorship contest, we held about 30-something percent. In, in presidential, we held about 30-something percent. So from those parameters of realistic expectation, right. I, I think one couldn't have been a liability okay. but an asset. And a final note, Minister, can Nigerians trust that this administration would maximize the oil and gas resources? I, I think so. I, I believe that that is why I am there. The moment I feel that I can add that value, then there's really right. no need to be hanging in there. Um, um, there is a lot we still need to do. There's a lot of policies that need to be confronted brutally. You've mentioned some of them here. There's a lot of resources that need to be attracted externally and into, into the system. We need to become uh, an external uh, an internal attraction for mm. private sector investments that are hovering all over the world and not depend just on government. 
um, um, th there's need to, for a unified front in tackling all the problems within the ministry through all the parastatals collectively. But w once we do that, uh, quite frankly, Nigeria can compete with anywhere in the world. All right. Dr. Ibrahim Alibe Kachiku, Minister of State Petroleum Resources, it's been interesting talking to you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. For Thank talking. you. And that's our program today. We thank you for watching. Next week, we'll reach you again on One on One. I am Cyril Stober. Bye for now.